Calling All Cars, a copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling All Cars, San Francisco Police Calling All Cars. Wanted in connection with murder in Visitation Valley. Young girl, described as pretty, black hair, medium height, wearing green dress. Arrest and hold. That is all. Every listener to this program knows that it is sponsored by Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline. You also know that many, many cities and counties specify Rio Grande Cracked. That it powers more police and emergency cars than any other brand everywhere it is sold. But do you know what a difference the same gasoline makes in the feel of your own car? You've heard us talk about police car performance. But do you realize that this is not just an advertising phrase? What can we do to induce you to use the same gasoline that police and emergency cars use? Let us remind you that Rio Grande Cracked costs no more than other quality gasolines. And city operating records prove conclusively that it delivers more miles to the gallon than lower quality gasolines. You get greater speed from your car. You will feel the thrill of greater power under the hood. Your motor will be cooler, more efficient, and you'll feel less vibration. Will you give us an opportunity to prove all this to you? Drive into any Rio Grande station, fill up with cracked gasoline, and you'll agree there's a world of difference. Thank you. And now it is our pleasure to present the Sheriff of San Francisco County, who will speak to you from the studio of station KFRC in San Francisco, Sheriff Murphy. Good evening. If ever a criminal case proved that crime does not pay, the one you are about to hear does. The guilty ones are still serving lifetime sentences behind the thick gray walls of San Quentin Prison. I particularly remember this crime because I was acquainted with one of the relatives of the victim who was an old man living by himself, injuring no one, engaged in the peaceful pursuit of raising goats and selling the milk for a bare livelihood. The criminals did not obtain a single cent from him, for he had no money. But listen to how it happened. Just a few miles outside the bustling mass of people, the never-ending streams of noisy traffic, the towering buildings that make up the harbor city San Francisco, lies a small sloping valley. Although today it has become a thriving little community, at the time this case occurred, it was dotted here and there with tiny sun-baked shacks and inhabited mostly by sheep and goat herds. It was here in one of the tumble-down houses that Gaetano Marcelli lived, a recluse, his nearest neighbor some 300 yards away. Nearly 70 years old, Marcelli supports himself by selling milk from his small herd of goats to the inhabitants of the valley and to the occasional tourists who happen to stop in and refresh themselves before continuing their journey. One morning in September, Gaetano is tending to a sick goat when he hears a car approaching. Looking up, he sees it stop in front of his place. Sees two men and a girl get out and walk toward him. Oh. Hello, old timer. You got some nice fresh goat milk? I know got to know of the two tires, no. But maybe from yesterday I got some. I think it is still fresh. Yeah, that'd be all right, Pop. Yeah, we've never tasted any goat milk, and we thought we'd like to try it. All right. You come into the house. I'm I'm a find you some finer goat milk. Yeah. Okay. That's it, Jess. Yes, yeah. Sure. Perfect. You like to sit down, huh? Maybe the lady she's tired. Oh no, no, I'm all right, thank you. I... I'd rather stand. Yeah, don't worry about her. Now, let's get some milk. All right. It is here in this sack over here. How about it, Johnny? Let's stop this stalling. Yeah, keep your shirt on. I'll take care of him when he brings the milk. All right. Here you are, mister. It ain't quite so fresh, but she's good and the cold. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Now, suppose you tell us where you keep that dough you've got hidden around here. What's that? You heard him. Where's your money? We know you got plenty, and we're here to relieve you of it. Why, you must make a mistake. I got no money. I only got that there's a good submit. Now, listen to me, old timer. Huh? We happen to know you've got $10,000 in cash hidden around this dump of yours somewhere. Now, listen. And we're not leaving until we get it, see? Now, how about it? I'm going to tell you, Mr. You want it? You 
want to be a good boy and tell us where it's hidden, or do we have to get tough? Oh, Johnny, you promised you wouldn't. Shut up, Edie. I'll handle this my own way. Oh, my silly kick in and make it fast. I'm a sweat thing if I got in the money. I got the nothing but a good Samaritan with up. Oh, Johnny. Shut up. I'll make this old brother talk if I have to break every bone in his mangy body. Oh, please, please, I tell you the truth. Please, please, don't hit me no more. I'm a old man. All right, all right. Please. Stop crying and tell us where you got that dough. No, in. please, I can't give you no money. I ain't the guy for the money, I tell you. This old bird wants to sing. I'll show you what we'll do. Hand me that crap. Daddy, you promised you wouldn't hurt the old man. You gave me your word. I said I wouldn't hurt him if you'd talk. Uh, no. You won't talk, no, 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 please. Please, no. What are you going to do with that crap? You tell me where the money is. I ain't the guy for the money. I'm the guy for the money. You ain't the guy for the money. No, no, no. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the help, Phil. Now tear this place apart. That dough's around here somewhere. San Francisco Police Department. I, I want to report a murder. One moment, please. Been... I'll connect you with homicide. Homicide Department begins speaking. Hello. This is Sidney Morris, out in Visitation Valley. There's been a murder out here. At least I think it's a murder. All right, young fellow, one thing at a time. Where exactly are you now? Out at Old Bicana Marcellus Place. It's at 605 Wallace Avenue. 605 Wallace Avenue. All right, go ahead. Well, my sister-in-law found the old man a few minutes ago lying in a pool of blood in his house. He's beating up something off him. Did you try to talk to him or anything? Oh, no, sir. He's not able to talk. I... I think he's dead. All right, you stay right there. And don't touch anything, understand? Well, don't worry. I, I won't. Good, I'll be right out. Hey, Matt. Yes, sir. Send an ambulance out to this address right away. And tell the boys to stand by if the guy is dead. If not, take him in and patch him up. I'll be out there about the time they are. By the time Lieutenant McGinn arrives at the little shack, the ambulance crew has already taken the unconscious but still living Marcelli to the hospital. McGinn asks Deputy District Attorney Walter Schiller to go to the hospital and question the victim, then settles down to an investigation of the facts at the shack. Ah, uh, Miss Jones, you were the person who discovered the old man, I believe. Yes, sir. I suppose you tell me about it, just what happened. Well, I've been buying goat's milk from him every day for almost a year. So the day I came over to get some and found him that way... All beaten and crushed. Oh, Lieutenant, it's, it's, it's awful. Yes, of course, I know. I can appreciate how you must feel. Now, have you any idea who might have done this? No, sir. There just doesn't seem to be any reason for it. Why, old Gartano was one of the most harmless people I've ever known. He couldn't have had any enemies. No, and yet someone beat him up. That doesn't quite jive, does it? I don't know. Only, oh, I don't know. Oh, well, that's all right, miss. I won't need you anymore. Uh, Suppose you go home and get some rest. You look as though you needed some. Thank you, Lieutenant. I, I'm sorry to be such a crime. Oh, I think nothing of it. You'll just run along now, and thanks for the help. Big pardon, Lieutenant, but there's a woman here says she knows something about this. You want to talk to her? Well, certainly, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, this is Lieutenant McGinn, ma'am. He's in charge here. You just tell him what you know. Well, I, I don't know that it has anything to do with all this, really, but yesterday in the late afternoon sometime, I... I seen a car come up and pass Gaetano's house real slow. And then a few minutes later, it come back by again and stopped. Just down the road there where I could see it, plain as day. Mm -hmm. Go on. Well, uh, there was a couple of young men in it and a girl. A pretty girl she was, too. Well, what makes you think they had anything to do with this? Oh, they was acting funny-like, peering over at Gaetano's place and talking among themselves. Mm -hmm. They looked suspicious to me. Can you give me any sort of a description of them? Well, best as I could see, the girl had on a bright green dress. And she had black hair, very black hair. Do you notice anything about the car? Mm, I, I ain't much of knowing one from another. It had white tires, though. I remember that. White tires? Pardon me a moment, ma'am. Hey, Sergeant. Hey, yes, sir. Go find the nearest phone and call headquarters. Tell them to get out a general search for a car with white wall tires. Also a girl with black hair wearing a bright green dress. And make it fast. Yes, sir. Also have every car rental place in town checked. Every garage. Yes, sir. Eddie. Yes, Lieutenant. You stick around here. Question everybody who knows anything and report to me. I'm going over to the hospital and see the old man, if he's still with us. And at the hospital, Detective Lieutenant McGinn joins Deputy Schiller at the bedside of old Gaetano Marcelli. It is obvious that the old man has only a few hours of life left. Gaetano. Gaetano. Can you hear me? Yeah. I... I hear that. I, I hear it, but, but I, I got no money. No, no, only got 
the milk. He's delirious. If only he could get to tell me. Tell me who it was. Gaetano. Now listen to me. Who did this, Gaetano? Who hit you? No. No, no money. Only good milk. Oh, please. Please, Mr. Don. Don't hit me no more. Please. No use, no. Ellen. You can't get anything out of him. I'm afraid you're right, Walter. If only he could remember. It might clear the whole thing up. Oh, I've tried to talk to him ever since I got out here. So far, he doesn't do anything but mumble about money and goat's milk. Yeah, I heard. They want my, my, my money. They beat me, beat me. Real bad. Real, real, real bad. He's talking. Who beat you, Gatano? Try to think. We want to help you. They beat me. The man. And the girl, she, she, she was kind of... Pretty, pretty, but they beat me. Oh, beat me with the clubs. Bad. Beat me. Beat me. You get that, Walter? Yeah. He says that was a girl. And the people I talked to out there gave me a description of a pretty girl and two men who were around the place today. Come on. Okay. I'm going out to look for a car with white tires driven by two men and a girl in a green dress. All that day, Lieutenant McGinn and Deputy Schiller make the rounds of garages. You drive rental agencies. Keep an alert eye out for the wanted car and occupants, but no trace of it can be found. The following morning, Gaetano Marcelli dies, having given no further clue as to the identity of his assailant. And McGinn turns with more determination than ever to the task of locating the car. At last, two days after the murder, he approaches his 15th rental place for the day. Addresses the manager. How do you do? You're the manager of this place? Yeah, that's me. What can I do for you? Rent you a nice car? Well, not exactly. I'm looking for a car, though. A car with white tires on it. White tires? You mean you want white tires? <laughs> sure. I have just the thing. You have one with white tires? Sure. Why not? Ah, this is too good to be true. What's that? Oh, I was just thinking out loud. I'd like to introduce myself. Detective Lieutenant McGinn of the San Francisco Police. A policeman? So, sure. What if I done a policeman? Should be asking me questions. Uh, you don't have to worry. I don't know what you've done, and I don't care. What I really want is the names of the people who last rented that car with white tires and the date it was rented out. Sure, that's easy. I got it right here in my books. Fine. Let me see now. Would you have any idea about when it might have been out? Yeah, I think so. This is the fourth, isn't it? That's right. Two days ago would be the second. Suppose you look around the second of this month. Sure. August, August the 9th, August the 20th. September, here we are. September the 2nd. That's a Chrysler Roadster. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, it was out on the second. When did it go out? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, here it is, on the first. Uh, who rented it? The names here are Philip Mangarin and John Cusack. Oh, yeah, I remember them now. They was the fellows I had a little trouble about money with. What was that? Well, they said they'd bring me some money when they came back, but they didn't. I had a terrible time getting them to pay. You got their addresses there? Sure, right here in the black on white. Good. I'll take this book with me. It might be important. Oh, but they got to have that in my business. Ah, don't worry, we'll take good care of it. You can have it back as soon as I'm through with it. But right now, I need it more than you do. Returning to his office, McGinn locks the valuable book in his safe and taking two officers with him, proceeds at once to the address given by Philip Mangareen. Here's the place, boys. I don't think we'll have any trouble, but we'll stand by in case. Mr. Mangareen? Yes, Put on your hat. You're taking a ride with us. Hey, what's this all about? Police officers, Mangarin. Now, come on, make it fast. What's the charge? Suspicion of murder. Take him in, boys. And a few minutes later, at another rooming house... All right, Cusack. No, no use talking. You're coming with us. And the less you say about it, the better. Yeah, but what's it all about? Funny how you fellas always say the same thing. But if you're interested, we're arresting you on suspicion of murder. Murder? Nasty word, isn't it, Cusack? All right, come on, get going. Taking the protesting Johnny Cusack directly to his office, McGinn has Mangreen brought in, too, and together the two men sit before him, an instant denial springing to their lips at every question. What was your idea in bumping off the old man? That's what I'd like to know. Yeah, tough bone beef. We didn't bump him off, but anyone else. You got the wrong guys. Oh, I don't think so. You boys are in a pretty tight spot. We know more about all this than you think we do. Uh, don't let him bluff you. Phil, he hasn't got anything on us and he knows it. He's not bluffing anybody. Right. And neither are you boys. Why don't you tell me the truth and get it over with? We're telling you the truth. You boys stick pretty close together, don't you? Well, just where were you on the morning of September the 2nd? I don't remember. Maybe I can refresh your memory for you. 
Have you ever seen this book before? No. Sure? Yeah, I said no. How about you, Cusack? No, i never seen it either. Well, now, isn't that strange? Yeah, what's that strange about it? Simply the fact that both your names are written in it, as well as your addresses. What? Uh, where'd you get that book? Oh, you begin to remember it now, huh? I didn't say that. Let me see it closer. Why, sure, here. Help yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure, I, I've seen this before. Only I didn't recognize it at first. How about you, Margarita? Yeah. Yeah, I remember it now. It's from that uh, auto rental place. Yeah, that's right. Now, what I want to know is, where did you go on the day you rented that car? Well, we, we just drove around a bit. Didn't go anywhere in particular. You didn't drive out to Visitation Valley by any chance, did you? Why, well, I, I don't think so, no. You don't think so? Don't you know where you drove? I can't exactly remember everywhere we went. Who was the young girl with you? What young girl? Now, don't tell me you've forgotten that, too. You certainly have a pretty bad memory. How about you, Mangarine? You remember the young lady? Well, uh... All right, boys, all right, spill it. Run into a dead end, and you might as well tell me all about it. Well, I don't see what difference it'd make that we did have a dame with us. We didn't do anything wrong. Oh, of course not. What was her name? Edith. Edith what? What? Uh... Now we're getting places. Where does this Edith live? Uh, listen, what do you have to go mixing her up in this for? She was just out riding with us, sure, I'm telling you. Oh, I know. Now, where does she live? Over on Larkin Street, the Bryn Mall apartment. Thanks. Well, I guess you boys can go back to yourselves until I talk to your girlfriend. And while you're there... Think it over. Maybe that by the time I'm back, you'll have remembered a little more all about this. But upon arriving at the Bryn Mawr, McGinn is met by an elderly woman who says she is the girl's mother. I've come to have a little talk with your daughter, ma'am. Is she in? Why, no. Edith isn't living here anymore. That is, not at the present time. Well, could you tell me where I might find her? Well, I'm afraid I can't. You see... Edith told me she wanted to visit a friend of hers who lives in Los Angeles. And the other day, that is, two days ago, she packed up and left. I don't know exactly where she's staying down there. Didn't she give you any idea where you could reach her? Any forwarding address? Well, uh, she mentioned the Whitehall apartment. But I couldn't say for sure whether that's where she is or not. Uh, what is it you wanted? Oh, nothing important, ma'am. Just wanted to talk to her, that's all. But if she's in Los Angeles, well, I guess I'll just have to wait till she comes back here. Well, thanks for the information, anyhow. Well, you're quite welcome. Only I'd like to know why you wanted to talk to her. Oh, it was nothing important, really. Don't give it another thought. If she writes you or anything, why, just jot down her address and maybe I'll come back to see her later. Good day, ma'am. The Homicide Squad, Los Angeles Police. Please send someone to Whitehall Apartments, your city, to pick up girl. Name, Edith Watson. Black hair, wearing green dress. This girl wanted in connection with murder. Hold and notify this department. Begin, Homicide Department, San Francisco Police. Upon receipt of this message, Lieutenant Hamilton of the Los Angeles Police Department, in company with a fellow officer, go at once to the apartment house where they interview the landlady. Discover that a tenant of hers has a guest, a young girl with black hair. Climbing the stairs, the detectives stop in front of one of the doors. Then... Who is it? Police, ma'am. Open the door. Oh. Well, just a minute. Yes? You the party that lives here? Yes. You have a guest staying with you, is that right? Why, yes, a friend of mine. Is she in now? Why, yes. Do you want to speak to her? If you don't mind. Edith. Oh, yes? There's the men here to see you. Oh, all right. I'm coming. Yes? What is it? They're policemen. Police? Oh. I'm afraid you'll have to come along with us, miss. We got orders to arrest you for the San Francisco police. Oh, but I haven't done anything. I... Well, that's all right, ma'am. We can talk about that later. Right now, we're in kind of a hurry. And, uh, oh, you, you'd better come along, too, miss. Just a matter of formality, of course. Well, I don't know what Edith is mixed up in, but of course I'll come. That's fine. All right, let's go. Next day, Edith is taken to San Francisco and turned over to Lieutenant McGinn. And McGinn, wise to the ways of a woman, questions her in his office. Sit down, Edith. Thank you. There are just a few things I want to talk to you about. And if you'll answer them truthfully, why, this won't take long. Yes, sir. In the first place, why did you go to Los Angeles? Why? Why, I don't know. I, I'd wanted to go out and go down there for a visit for a long time, and, and this seemed like a good time to do it. Why at this particular time? Why not before? Before what? Before what happened out in Visitation Valley. But, I, 
I don't know what you're talking about. Would you like me to tell you about it? Why? Well, it isn't a very pretty story. It's about an old man. <sighs> so old, he couldn't defend himself. Who got beaten with a club until oh. he didn't have a bone left in his body that wasn't broken. Oh, please. Not a very pretty picture, is it, Edith? It's horrible. Why don't you save yourself the details and tell me exactly what happened out there that day? I asked him not to hit him. I pleaded with him, but they wouldn't listen to me. And what happened? They beat him and beat him and kept asking him where his money was hidden. And he kept saying he didn't have any money and, and kept begging them not to hit him. And they kept right Why, on. Hey, they? You mean Cusack and Mangarin? Yes. Yes, they did it. I don't care what they think. I hate them. They beat him. Will you testify to this in court, Edith? In court. Do I have to say that in front of them? Think of what they did. Yeah. Think of what they did. All right. I'll tell. I'll tell everything. And I hope they hang them. I hope they hang them. <laughs> Armed with this confession and a promise that Edith will testify in court, McGinn closets himself with prosecuting attorney Peter Mullins. And the two of them spend hours preparing a foolproof case against Mangarine and Cusack. I don't see how we can slip up on this, Alan. It's perfect. Yeah, I know it's perfect. But I don't want to take any chances. I've had too many perfect cases suddenly blow up in my face when some slippery mouthpiece pulled a lot of strings. I know. I've had the same thing happen to me. Well, the main idea is to let those two think they have us bluffed. That's why I don't want to tell them about the girl's confession. They might be able to think up some story between now and the time we go to trial. You mean you want her for a nation in the hole, eh? Exactly. We'll introduce as much evidence against them as we can from various witnesses and such. And then for the grand finale. I get it. You've got a conviction practically in your hands, Alan. Well, it all depends on you when we get into court. You're the one who does the talking there. I'm just a detective. Well, don't worry. With a case like this, I can't lose. <laughs> And one day in Judge J.J. Krabuco's court in San Francisco, the trial begins. In a steady line, the witnesses are sworn in, their testimony given. First comes a milkman who says, Sure, I seen him leaving Marcelli's house that morning, but I didn't think nothing of it. Lots of times people stopped by to buy some goat's milk from the old man. If I'd have known what was going on, I'd have sure stopped him. And you can bet your life on that. Next witness is a friend of Cusack's who says, Yes, sir. I saw Johnny driving a car with white tires. I yelled at him, but he didn't seem to want to see me. It was with that other fellow there and then the girl. Get out of you One after another, witnesses are produced, and each one tightens the noose around the prisoner's neck. And then, late one afternoon, after three days of the trial, prosecuting Mullins plays his final card. I should like to call Miss Edith Watson to the stand, please. Miss Edith Watson. Do you tell me swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guard? I do. Take the witness chair, please. What's the idea of putting that on the stand? What's that dame up to? I don't know, but I don't like it. Miss Watson, listen. I want you to tell the jury, in your own words, exactly what happened in Gaetano Marcella's house the morning in question. Well, Johnny Cusack and Phil Mangarine and I drove out to the old man's house. We were going to rob him. But I didn't know there was going to be any violence. I thought they were just going to rob him. Ah, you but when he was he not have any more. He wasn't going to beat him. I begged him to stop. Johnny's promised me to get out. Here they go. Off with that little slip. Off with this what you can't watch. The Johnny's quit. But talk she does. And when she is through, there is no doubt in the jurors' minds as to what verdict to bring in. After only 15 minutes, they return with a verdict of guilty and a recommendation for leniency for the girl. And as a result, the following day, Judge Tribuco pronounces sentence. Philip Mangarine, John Cusack, stand and face the court. Before I pass judgment on you, have you anything to say? Yeah, but it wouldn't do no good. Very well. You have been found guilty of first-degree murder. Unfortunately, the members of the jury have made it impossible for me to give you the sentence you deserve. However, I can do the next best. John Cusack and Philip Mangarine, for the murder of Gaetano Marcelli, I sentence you to life imprisonment 
in the state penitentiary. And a few days later, Edith Watson is given a sentence of 10 years, suspended, and put on probation. Judge Tribuco explaining his actions by saying, In turning state's evidence, this girl's testimony was instrumental in convicting the actual killers. Also, it has never been shown that she was in any way connected with the murder, although she was a party to the attempted robbery. Therefore, I feel that a long-term probation would serve a much better purpose than a jail sentence. Calling all cars invites every boy and girl to join the junior police department. We offer you a complete detective outfit free. Get dad or mother or one of your neighbors to drive you into your neighborhood Rio Grande station. Ask for your free copy of the Calling All Cars News and learn all about Rio Grande's 14 free gifts. We owe a great deal to you millions of boys and girls who listen to this program. You have induced your parents to try Rio Grande crack, and hundreds of letters testify to the unusual distinctive qualities of this gasoline. All we ask is that you give Rio Grande crack a fair trial. We are confident that your car will develop greater speed and power and that you'll get a new thrill out of Rio Grande's police car performance. There's another big value at all Rio Grande stations, and that is Sinclair Motor Oil. When you get your next crankcase drain, give your Rio Grande dealer the job. You'll refill with Sinclair Motor Oil from refinery sealed cans, and you'll quickly discover your motor runs smoother, cooler, and that you need seldom add another quart. That's because all the impurities are removed from Sinclair Motor Oil. Those elements that cause carbon, that gum up your valves, that burn away so easily in hot motors, are already extracted from Sinclair Motor Oil leaving only a pure oil that gives you more miles for your money than ever before. Calling all cars. San Francisco Police calling all cars. Cancellation broadcast 137. Suspects in this case now in custody. That is all. All right. 